Welcome to Making the Cut Podcast with Chris Hill and Sean Winner, where we help you succeed in life and business by sharing principles and strategies that guide some of the most successful people in the world. Welcome to episode 30 of the Making the Cut Podcast. I'm Chris Hill with my co-host, Sean Winner. Today on the podcast, we have Richard Corain, the chief of staff of the world-famous Union Square Hospitality Group. Before jumping into our conversation with him, Sean, how about a quick word from our sponsor? That's right, Chris. Le Cordon Bleu is considered to be synonymous with outstanding quality, setting standards in both the culinary arts and the hospitality industry for over 120 years. If you want to set yourself apart from the competition, prepare for a career of exciting opportunities and learn the very best of new world innovation and cuisine with the principles, techniques, and artistry of the French traditions. Apply at cordonbleu.edu. And with that, Chris, first, Happy New Year, man. 2018. Happy New Year to you, sir. How are things going down there in Florida? Oh, it's freezing. <laughs> you know, I saw the funniest thing today. It was it was a picture of a guy from 300, like the Spart- not, yeah, Spartans, and it said Floridians during a Cat 5 hurricane, and it showed the Spartans, right, ready to take on the hurricane. <laughs> and then it said Fr- Floridians in cold weather, and it had the lion from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> and that is me right now. I have a sweatshirt, hooded sweatshirt, pea coat, um, thermal leggings under my pants inside my house, and it's probably about 50 degrees outside. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to hear it, man. But I'm excited to connect with Richard today, right? You you connected with him for your book, right? Yes, yeah, Sean, I sure did. You know, that was probably a couple of years ago now when I was interviewing you know people, really, you know, trying to find the best in the industry. I think Richard and his involvement with Union Square Hospitality Group is definitely up there. He's a really insightful guy. I think we're going to have a great conversation with him. For those of you that do not know Richard, uh, he joined Union Square Hospitality Group as a partner in 1996, following a decade of leadership with Wolfgang Puck Group. He actually launched his own restaurant, Hawthorne Lane, which opened in San Francisco in 1995. As Union Square Hospitality Group's chief of staff, Richard is the liaison between the chief executive officer, Danny Meyer, their leadership and executive group, and his family of businesses. So he's a super busy guy. I'm, I'm excited that he was able to take away some time for us. What do you say we uh, jump right in, John? Yeah, let's do it. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. How's it going today? Well, it's a bit cold here in the Northeast, specifically uh, New York. But other than that, uh, excited to be on the podcast and very excited to uh, dive into 2018. Absolutely. Can't, can't uh, complain at all. Well, I know a lot of our listeners are very familiar with your work, even if they don't quite know you by name. Could you talk a bit about your background, how you've gotten to this point in your career, and what you do now? So originally, my intent was to play sports as a career. And I quickly learned uh, when I got out of high school that sports did not necessarily want me to choose that as a career in terms of the amount of talent that was better than me. Mother actually had the idea that uh, I should go to culinary school. And she got that idea from my uncle, who many years ago was in charge of dining at the White House for President Kennedy. And uh, my dad was an Air Force pilot, and I knew I didn't want to be in the military. And I knew I wasn't wise enough to be a pilot. But when my mom called my uncle and said, what do you think about the CIA as uh, as a next step? He not only sanctioned it, but he offered help in terms of, uh, you know, being a reference for me or what he thought was a, a, a very enriched career path. Even back then, way before it became fashionable, was the food industry. And I had always looked up to him as a youngster because, you know, his affiliation with the White House and he did food and all sorts of things like that. And he went on to become the director of food service for the U.S. Navy after that. So he was always, in my mind, somebody that had made a very rich career uh, out of the food service business. And off I went to the CIA. And after the first day there, uh, I remember, and uh, I don't want to tell you when... I went there because for any of the listeners who may think I have a youthful voice, it will place me <laughs> in, a, in a timeline where my age will be evident. So 
uh, let's just say when, when I completed my first day at the CIA, I went to the payphone outside of one of the classrooms and I put in a quarter into the payphone and that'll sort of tell you the years I was there. Uh, and I called my parents and I said, uh, this is the most amazing school I have ever seen in my life because after one day I walked around classrooms and I saw people wearing white and, you know, they had these beautifully pressed hats and it was the most amazing thing. And I saw people cutting and chopping and measuring and baking and, and all of these things. And it was just fascinating to see people that were already really good at something. And I said to my parents, this is the most amazing school I have ever seen in my life, but I don't want to be a chef. And I can still hear the silence on the other end of the phone right now because I think my, my parents had said, oh, no, what, what do we do now? But I did understand back then that food as a career had a path. Um, I like to think of myself, and this is a, a completely self attached accreditation that I was a pioneer way back then saying, I'm going to go to a culinary school with absolutely no plans to be a chef afterwards. People I went to school with back then, 99% of them went to the CIA to become chefs or, you know, back then they taught ice carving and things like that, but it was all culinary based for the most part. But I knew one thing. I knew that just like in sports where I was never going to be the best player on the field or the court or the ice, that I was never going to be the most talented chef in the classroom. And I looked at a classroom of 20 people. Uh, I think that was the amount when I went. And I knew I was the 20th most creative person with a bunch of ingredients or with nice skills or the ability to say that sauce doesn't look like the right color. And I just knew that people were gifted in that. So there was a part of me that said, if I can't be the best at something, I don't want to do it. But I also saw that there were so many opportunities in the food service business. So when I graduated from CIA, I wound up going to uh, University of New Hampshire School of Business. And when I got out of there, I sort of had sort of a business skill set and a culinary skill set, and I tried to do something with that. And I was fortunate enough to meet a man named Wolfgang Puck who uh, had come into one of the restaurants I was working at and uh, offered me a job. And I think it took me about five seconds to say absolutely. And, and I went to work for Wolf, and he sent me to San Francisco where I operated a restaurant called Post Trio. And uh, through that, I met Danny Meyer, who... 32 years ago, maybe, 1987, 80, so 31 years ago, uh, had just Union Square Cafe, and when he would come to New York, when I would go to New York, I would see him, and when he would come to California, he would see me, and we became professional sort of commiserators, and by that I mean he would say, gosh, I'm having problems with this in, at Union Square, what do you guys do here, and I would do the same thing. And we would sort of share regulars. He'd say, one of my regulars is coming to San Francisco, and I'd take care of him and vice versa. And then in 1996, he said, you know, look, I just opened Gramercy Tavern, and I'm looking to do more and sort of start a company that can do a number of things. I don't want to be just a restaurateur. You know, I want to, I want to do things that haven't been done before. And... I remember walking through Union Square with him and him saying, well, why couldn't, you know, whoever wrote the rule that you couldn't do good food in bowling alleys or, or train stations or, you know, sporting venues. And so in 96, Danny made me a partner and we created Union Square Hospitality Group. And, you know, my the interesting thing was my first job with Danny was what he called extend Danny's reach. And that was a funny way of saying to people internally and externally, I can't be in two places at one time, but Richard's going to help me be where I need to be. And when we had two businesses, it was extend Danny's reach. When we had four, it was director of operations. And when we had six, it was COO. And then for 12 years, I was the COO, which is a fancy way of saying 
everybody needs a boss and it can't be Danny. So it's got to be somebody. And because I would create all these businesses with Danny, it made sense that everybody would report to me afterwards. Um, so <clears throat> I was the COO for about 12 years. Then after that, we made a conscious choice to grow the company. Uh, and I focused on business development for another five years to increase sort of the enterprise of our company in a way that kept it culturally, operationally, and financially sound as we grew. Um, and that was an important point for us because for many years, we just took calls that came in and people would say, hey, we'd like you to do this or we'd like you to do that. What do you think? And we look at it and go, yeah, that sounds good. We could do that. But once I got in the biz dev role, we made a conscious choice to say, what do we actually want to be doing? And let's go out and try to do those things. And we need somebody to sort of lead that. And that's what I did. And that was for another five years. And then for the last few, uh, we have my title is chief of staff. What it really means is sort of the way I started, which is extend Danny's reach perform a function that sort of mimics the COO function, which is to coordinate all the C-level people on our team and give them a conduit for Danny because he's not going to manage them day to day and basically keep things moving forward uh, in a way that, you know, makes us efficient, effective, and true to our mission. I probably took up way too much time telling you how I got here, but it's, it's pretty nonfiction. No, not at all. Not at all. So so just to reflect back, because you've taken us through this evolution. I'm always curious of something. Was there when you look back, whether it's at the beginning of your career, middle of your career, was there something and by something, I mean, leadership, business development, growth, scale strategies. Was there something that you just got completely wrong that later on you realized, wow, I really was off base and your course corrected as you kind of matured in business or leadership. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a whole nother dozen podcasts uh, <laughs> that I'm happy to do. Um, but the, the answer is absolutely. Uh, and, you know, looking back on on just our growth, it's, it's been a great learning lesson because, and this is something I, I teach young entrepreneurs because, what I find now is that everybody is, not everybody, but people who want to get into business with an entrepreneurial spirit, they, they feel the need to develop the perfect business plan before they get in the arena. And what I counsel people on is the fact that there are more lessons to be learned in the arena when you open than there are negotiating with yourself in sort of a conference room or on, you know, a, a business plan, trying to sand it down and make it perfect. There's a lot of things you just don't know. And I would much prefer to be in the game learning those things than wasting time trying to, to, to manage my assumptions of what could happen. And I also find that to be the most uh, exhilarating and fun part of what we do, the course correction. We've always looked at it as learning as opposed to failure. And, you know, like I said, every business that we've started has needed a course correction. Sometimes they've been major, sometimes they've been minor, but we've never nailed it 100% from day one. And, and if you look at Shake Shack as an example, that business was created for the specific purpose of being an amenity for a park, right? If you've been to the the original Shake Shack in Madison Square Park R. Our assignment by the Parks Department was create something that is additive to the park. That's an amenity for all the park goers. We never set out to create a burger business. We never set out to create a public company. It was primarily and, you know, created to bring people to the park. We were fortunate that we struck a chord with people and we had a product that they found attractive and they would line up for but it took us five years to open the second one because we just kept saying the reason we're here is to bring people to the park and we got to keep getting better. And we don't really think the burger's perfect yet. And the milkshakes could be a little better and we got to keep working at it. But our job is to really be in the parks. So the shack was my project to begin with. Um, and what we first thought was people lined up for these 
sort of made to order hot dogs in the park, but we're going to have a business that's going to serve primarily hot dogs and maybe a few burgers, but people are coming here for the hot dog, French fries and milkshakes. And if you look at, you know, the name of the business, there's nowhere in there, it, you know, Shake Shack, it doesn't say Shake Shack and burgers. And, you know, we now have a business that is in the burger category, and it might be the only one that doesn't have the word burger in it. So it was never even created to be a burger business. Uh, I can tell you from firsthand experience, that first day we were open, and I know this because I was at the griddle cooking hamburgers, uh, first order that came in was for 24 hamburgers. And it was from a, an intern on the trading floor of an investment bank that was in the building across the park. And the good news was the guy ordered 24 burgers. The bad news was our griddle only could hold 12 because we didn't plan on making that many hamburgers. So what happened was a line started, not because the burgers were great, but because I couldn't keep up. The other thing that happened was I think we had planned to serve 200 hamburgers that day. 200 hamburgers went out the window in about 20 minutes. So I remember at like 1230 putting up a sign that said we're out of hamburgers. And what happened was people thought that the line was for hamburgers and that they sold so many hamburgers by 1230 that they sold out. So the burger must be amazing. Truth of the matter is I couldn't keep up and we only had 200 patties that day. And that's all we could serve. But that's sort of how the line started the first day. Um, and I remember talking to a friend of mine in the music business that night, and he said, how did it go? And I said, well, I guess it went pretty good. We ran out of hamburgers, but I'm sort of frustrated that I couldn't make the line go faster, and I don't want to see a line out there ever again. He said, actually, you know what? The line's the best thing you got going for you. He goes, I'd make the line go a little faster, but if people see a line, that's that says something good's going on there. You know, that's, that's one lesson from the shack, but I could give you 10 more examples of how we missed the mark with Shake Shack or Blue Smoke or 11 Madison Park. So Richard, you know, Shake Shack's been around, I guess, going on nearly 15 years now. Looking at that business, uh, obviously quite different than Union Square Cafe, Gramercy Tavern, even, you know, most of, of the portfolio that you guys have now. What was it like saying, you know, let's try this or even, you know, Blue Smoke being you know, a barbecue place in a completely um, more you know, refined atmosphere? What are those decisions like for you guys? How do you go about making that happen? Well, it's, it's somewhat simple in that we, we always look for things that we're personally passionate about. So if you go back, let's take Blue Smoke as an example, because uh, <clears throat> another good case study of, of uh, our intent not um, getting out of the gate the way that we wanted to. And so um, back, I don't know, the early 2000 issues, 99, you know, Danny and I and a couple of our, our partners here were very passionate about authentic barbecue. And, you know, take yourself back then, there was no such thing as a category of urban barbecue. Barbecue existed um, primarily in the Midwest and Texas and around those areas, uh, in terms of its authenticity, there was no such thing as artisanal barbecue for the most part, especially in major cities. Um, and we always found ourselves when we, when we had time to travel craving places like Memphis or Texas or Kansas city because we were, we were so craving authentic barbecue. And, you know, Danny, uh, we, we reached a point where we said, gosh, wouldn't it be great to have a barbecue restaurant sometime uh, without having to open it in the Midwest? Uh, and Danny's, we came across a, a business, which is where Blue Smoke is right now, and it was Danny's cousin had a restaurant there. And his restaurant was doing pretty well, um, but he just didn't uh, like the life of a restaurateur. I think he was a lawyer by trade. And, you know, he had a, a pretty decent restaurant, but he just didn't like the restaurateur life. Um, and he had asked Danny if he wanted to take over the restaurant. And we looked at it, and it was a you know, solid business. And we said, okay, 
what would we do here? And Danny said, you know, why couldn't we do authentic barbecue? And, you know, we started to sort of make ourselves known to people that we thought were, were doing the best at what they did. And there's a guy named Mike Mills um, at 17th Street Barbecue in the Midwest who we considered to be the greatest rib maker uh, ever on the planet. And Danny had known him through Memphis in May and things like that. And all of our sort of sources said he, he makes the greatest rib on the planet. So we struck up a friendship with him and, you know, we said, look, is it crazy to think we could do barbecue in the middle of New York city? He said, no. And I, you know, I don't think so. If you had the right smoker and wood and you could, you could do it the right way, you know, I think you could do it. And so he taught us, he, he was instrumental in helping us understand sort of the science and mechanics behind it. And then we sort of set out over a year to do discovery on where the best barbecue was. And, you know, we found some amazing inspirations outside of Austin for brisket and Mike's ribs. And, you know, we said, okay, well, if Mike's going to help us develop the smoker and, and teach us how to do ribs, you know, I, I think we can do this. And we, you know, we created Blue Smoke, which was our version of authentic barbecue. But there was a, a very amazing sort of thing that we learned in in the barbecue world, which is, and this is something I figured out very early, which is if you're in the barbecue business, the best you can ever do is come in second because everybody always has a place that's better. And, you know, if it's ribs, people go, you know, those are good, but the best ones are actually in Chicago on a street corner with a guy that only makes them on Friday, but these are pretty good, but those are the ones that are the best. And then there's a whole school of who's got the best brisket and all of those things. Um, and so one, you know, once we opened the, what we thought was authentic barbecue, people were very quick to tell us, I see what you guys are trying to do here in New York city, but you know what? You should leave that to the people in the Midwest because this, this tastes okay, but it's not authentic. And it was a good learning experience for us because we thought if you just had a really good sort of person teaching you and you had the right equipment, i.e. the right smoker, and he taught you how to use the wood and you got good products, all you'd have to do is put them in the smoker and out would come this sort of authentic barbecue. And there is a big difference between making one sort of brisket really well and making enough brisket to serve 500 people throughout the day and holding the meat and all of that. And it was a great learning experience for us to say there's a difference between being a barbecue restaurant and making good barbecue at home. And so it took us it took us a while to overcome the fact that we just didn't have that great of a product, although we thought we could learn it, that it really takes time to understand the barbecue culture and the barbecue science. And what we did was something that was sort of unique, which was we said, you know what, everybody, you're right. This, this isn't as good as all those other places. But what we want to do is to say – we really admire those guys. So we created what was called the Big Apple Barbecue Block Party, where every year we would invite 10 pitmasters from across the country, the ones that we thought were the best. And we'd bring people together around Madison Square Park. And over two days, we would get 110,000 people to celebrate barbecue in America. And we just said, we may not be the best, but we know where the best is, and we're just going to hang around with these people and bring them to you to show you how serious we are. And that was that was very helpful for for Blue Smoke to get its legs, literally. But it was it was very humbling to say you just can't get a smoker and do authentic barbecue. But there was no such thing back then as urban barbecue. Yeah. Now you see it everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, Richard, so Chris had mentioned all of these different concepts and, and you had taken us from the evolution of just an extension kind of of Daniel to now managing all these places and growing. How do you ensure or how did you, because being now the chief of staff, how did you ensure the culture maintained from 
one, two, three places up to where you all are now with this massive group. How, how did you ensure that that culture stayed intact? Or was there a point where it fell apart and you had to kind of pull it back together? All of the above. Okay. Uh, <laughs> our, intent always, uh, our intent always was to grow the company through the culture. And we just assumed that if you hired the right people, which we've always tried to do, and you just said, okay, here's what you got to do, and you guys are culture carriers, it would naturally happen. Um, not so. And, and any anybody that's ever operated a business will tell you that. Um, but what we found early on was uh, it's all about leadership. So I would say back when I, when I officially had the title COO and I had – you know, every chef and GM in the company reporting to me um, in each business and other functions within the company, such as marketing and things like that. My best time was not in managing the businesses. It was developing leadership skills for people to do that. And it's, it's really as simple as establishing how you do things, Right. And, and that's really what I think leaders need to do. They need to basically say, here's the river banks. Here's where you can start and here's where you can stop. And everything in between is entirely up to you. But, but leaders definitely need to, to set the direction of, of how you do things. And, what, and, and, you know, there, there are a couple of, of stories I can tell you about this. Number one is, um, we excelled when we grew people from within. We failed miserably and painfully uh, when we hired people from outside that were very, very accredited, had great experience, had, you know, pe- they, you know, they were the best at what they did in their company. But what we found was they weren't cultural fits. And you know, we almost always failed when we hired somebody at a high level from outside of the company and expected them to be cultural fits overnight just by reading, setting the table. And what I learned a long time ago when I first got to be the COO was the more time you spend with your leaders, the better. And that's really, I think, the, the lesson for anybody but the days of read this book or read this manual and then go into the business and do this, those days are long gone. What people need now is, is your time, your wisdom. And what I found was um, what people wanted from me as sort of the head guy were three things. They wanted me to be sort of the compass. Which way is north? Just make sure I'm going north. The second thing was they wanted my wisdom, right? Because I have experience. I'm one of the, the leaders of the company. They want, they want to use me as a library. And I, I need to be able to be used as a library in a number of different ways. Some people want to use me to help them with their food cost. Some people want to use me to help them with hiring. Um, and I, I need to be in a position where they can take a book out of me on a subject that matters to them and engage them. Um, And the third thing they need, and this is really important in our company, they need a cheerleader and somebody that believes in them. And, you know, if you have a company where you hire people that are, you know, wired to do something really well, they don't want people walking around every day telling them how how many mistakes they made. They want to hear a lot of, that was awesome. And high achievers are not you know, really bred to make a ton of mistakes, but they will every so often. And what I think leaders do is to say, look, that was a big mistake or, you know what, that's trivial. Let's get back in the game. And so as a coach and as a mentor and as a leader, I've got to be a cheerleader a lot of times, which I love doing and which Danny loves doing. And that's sort of our, our company culture. But the other thing was in terms of developing um, businesses that were thriving, I, I, I used to be the person in our company that was always looking for the right management sort of equation. And I would go outside of our offices at Barnes and Noble and I would go there, you know, once every month and I'd buy the new book 
that was out on on management theory and and whatever was the next big thing I had the book and I'd read it over a weekend and I'd come into my partner meetings and I'd say, Hey guys, I got the answer now. It's in this book. We just have to do this. And, and after about six months of that, my partners rightfully said, you said that last month and you said that the month before, and it's always something new and they were right. And so I decided to sort of do a, a self assessment company wide and come up with my own sort of theory and I looked at businesses that we had that were thriving. And I looked at businesses that we had that weren't thriving or, or were, were dysfunctional or, or didn't have it all together and I needed to spend more time in. And I looked for correlations on both of them. And, and what I got to very quickly was the leadership had, had done three things really well. And when they weren't performing, they, these three things were not very evident. And it's so simple, but if you, if you apply this to any business or any leadership um, sort of person, it, it's easy to create an organization that is functional. And the, the thing to remember, the, the opposite of functional is dysfunction. And dysfunction to me is what cripples and kills an organization faster than just about anything. And what I came to was in businesses that were thriving, the leader had very clearly articulated um, what they wanted people to do. So if you, if you look at this sort of statement a different way, I would say, and this is what people in my co company know me as, people want three things from their boss. Number one, they want you to, they want to know what you want them to do. So the clearer you are on, what you want them to do in any job scope could be executive chef, could be maitre d', whatever it is. I should know as an employer, this is exactly what you want me to do. And also inherent in that it's important to me as the boss and the leader to say, not only is this what I want you to do, but here's what success looks like if you're doing this really well, because then I can visualize ah, this is what's happening if, if I'm doing this job really well. If I can show people, here's, here's what success looks like to me if you're doing all this, they can sort of focus on that. The second thing that people need from their boss is, how am I doing in my job? So the feedback loop. On an ongoing basis, I need to give you constant feedback, good or bad. And this is where, I again, I get back to the cheerleader. If you're doing a good job, you shouldn't have to wait for me to tell you that. I mean, you should be proud knowing, but I should, I should come up to you on a regular basis and just go, dude, that was awesome. And that's, you know, that's feedback. And so the more of that you do, employee reviews, sit down with people, but you should never wonder where you are in what you're doing. And the third thing, and this is, this is something that causes dysfunction in an organization and is very hard to eradicate. People want a level playing field. They want to know that if I do what you ask me to do and I do really well at it, then the sky's the limit in, in this company. I don't want to know that there are politics in play or that your best friend is actually the sous chef and that he or she's going to get a promotion before everybody else because you guys live in the same neighborhood in New Jersey where he was your college roommate or she and your wife are best friends. I don't want to know as an employee that there's anything blocking me other than performance from getting to the top of, top of the mountain. And people can sniff an unlevel playing field very quickly. And those three things create, if they're done really well, create a very aligned functional unit because I know where I'm supposed to start and stop in my job scope. I know how I'm doing. And there are no political elements or impediments or otherwise standing in my way of, of going up the chain. If I don't know what my job is supposed to be or if there's gray area between what I'm supposed to be doing and the other person, we're going to bump into each other and we're going to get annoyed at each other and that's going to cause dysfunction. If you don't tell me how I'm doing, I'm going to keep doing things that I think I should be doing and those might not be the ones you want me to do. And you've never told me what success looks like anyway. So I'm just going to keep doing stuff until you tell me not to. And then sometimes when you tell me not to, you're going to go, 
you're so far off base in what you should be doing. And I'm going to go, why don't you tell me earlier? And that's mm-hmm. going to cause me to be unhappy and not as functional equals dysfunction. And I'm definitely going to be dysfunctional if I know that somebody's got a better deal than me. I'm not going to sign up. I'm going to leave and I should leave because the system's gamed against me. Yeah, I love that. So Richard, as you're hiring and and I know the idea of enlightened hospitality is big within y'all's company and culture does maybe you could touch on that but also you know as you're hiring does the skill set and personality do those does what you're looking for differ when hiring for management versus a, a frontline worker or do you maybe hire everyone thinking that this person might have a chance to move their way up it's pretty much the same the one thing you need to think about with managers is and I'm not speaking about GMs per se, but sort of mid-level managers, they're almost like, you know, your, your nanny. If you have children, you're giving them your kids every day and you got to make sure that your kids are safe and that your kids are happy and that your kids, you know, are, are able to be happy every day. And so you're, you know, you're trusting them with something that's very sacred to you, which is your business, but also your employees who make your business. So, the, you know, the one thing that is important to us is who the person is. Because, you know, I can teach people how to open a restaurant. I can teach people how to close a restaurant. I can teach them how to make a bank. I can teach them how to seat a guest. All those things are teachable skills. Um, but they need to be sort of uh, what we call caregivers of the highest order um, before they even do one thing. And by that, I mean... You know, they, we need to hire people that are very self-aware and who have great joy making sure that other people are happy. And, you know, what I've learned in hiring managers, um, I only ask three questions in a job interview, and it takes me about eight minutes. And I would say, based on these three questions, I've got about a 98% success rate of hiring the right person. Um, I can tell you the three questions if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first question is, uh, what is the biggest misperception of you by other people? And then tell me why that's not who you are. The reason I ask that is because it requires the person to tell me how they believe the world views them. Right. And we're in a perception business, right? Uh, If you guys go out, for lunch or dinner, I'm betting you probably take about five or 10 seconds to assess whether somebody's glad you're in that restaurant or not based on, on their disposition or their body language or whatever. I'm the same way. I know that guests in our restaurants are the same way. So I need somebody that fully is self-aware of how the world might be viewing them. But remember, the question is, what is a misperception about you? So that requires the person to say, I think I may be sending off these messages sometimes, but that's not really who I am. But I do understand I may be sending off these messages. So if I were to answer that question myself, I would answer it, well, the biggest misperception is that when I'm quiet, I'm unhappy. And the reason I say that is because I'm a fairly social person. If you see me around the office or in the restaurants, I'm generally talking to somebody right? Um, that, that's what we do. We're social people. I'm not sitting in front of a computer all day doing spreadsheets. I'm, I'm out engaging people. So people would expect me all of the time to be very social. So if I'm not social, I'm sending off a message that there's something going on with me, right? Because all of a sudden I'm not social. So what I would say, and, and this is true, is that if I'm quiet, I'm unhappy. The the truth of the matter is I've got about an hour's worth of time during the day to get administrative stuff done, both for me and Danny and other people. Um, and, and the other thing is I suffer from migraine headaches. So sometimes I just have to tune the world out and just not talk to anybody if I get a really bad headache, but in neither case am I unhappy, but people would assume that I'm unhappy because I'm not being social. So I would answer it. If I'm quiet, I'm unhappy, but 
that's not who I am. Here's why I'm quiet. But I understand people see me in a different way. So I'm very self-aware. So that requires actually two answers from somebody. But it shows me that they know how the world perceives them. And they assume responsibility for it. So the second, the second question is, and I'll give you a real, the, the greatest response to this ever. What is the last gift you gave somebody for any reason? I ask that because that shows somebody's capacity to give something to another person without, spec, without expecting anything in return, right? So the person that says to me, oh, the last gift I gave somebody was my college roommate's birthday was yesterday, so I went on Amazon and I sent him uh, you know, six really nice wine glasses. Well, anybody could do that, right? You, you recognize somebody's birthday and you, you did a gift, but it was sort of something that you had to get off your list. But here's the best response ever to this question. Ask that question, guys. Guy immediately gets a giant smile on his face, right? So he's already excited to tell me the story about a gift he gave. So, you know, he sort of answered the question already because he was enthusiastic to tell me about a gift he gave. But, but it goes on and on, so the, the, he got a big smile on his face, and he said, oh, the last gift I gave, I cooked lunch. I cooked my girlfriend's favorite halibut for her lunch as a gift. And I was like, uh, okay, you know, because I was expecting some big answer. And so I was like, okay. And he's like, no, that's not the whole story. Okay, go ahead. He said, well, you know, I knew what her favorite halibut was because she, because she you know, she likes this cookbook. And so I got the cookbook and I took the, the day of her birthday, I took the whole day off work. So now we start really uncovering the answer to this question. Here's a guy that's ready to sacrifice for the person that he, he's giving a gift to, right? He took the day off of work. So he's not even, he's not even going to work. He wants to do this thing for his girlfriend. There's a guy that wants to sacrifice. So I think I got a pretty good guy coming up here, but the story goes on and he says, so I got the recipe and I wanted to get the best halibut I possibly could. And I heard that all the great chefs in New York go to the Fulton fish market to get their fish at like five in the morning. So I got up and I went down to the Fulton fish market at 5 a.m. And I found a guy that was wearing a chef's coat and asked him if he could help me pick out the best halibut. And he took me over to this fish monger and I got the most amazing halibut. So now you got a guy that will sacrifice. Now you got a guy that has very high standards. He only wants the best product for his girlfriend. And he says, and then I did the same thing at the green market because I wanted the best tomatoes and zucchini. I wanted all the products in this to be the best. So I found another chef and he got me all the best vegetables. So, Guy's got high standards, guy that likes to sacrifice. Um, and then, he, then, then the story got even more interesting. And he said, so he goes, I got home at around noon, and I wanted this to be perfect for my girlfriend when she got home from work. So I wanted to practice the recipe ahead of time so I wouldn't fail. So now you got a guy that will sacrifice. You got a guy with high standards. You got a guy that doesn't like to fail. He wants to do something really well. And so, like, I was sold then, but then he, he sort of finished the story. He said, so I cooked this fish, and it came out really, really great, and I mastered the recipe, and I wasn't hungry, so I didn't know what to do with the fish. So I went down, and I surprised my doorman with lunch, and my doorman had always ordered, like, takeout from a bodega or an egg sandwich, and I surprised him with the best lunch. And he said, that's the best lunch I've ever had. So I made his day. But now you got a guy that gave a gift to somebody else, not even the primary person he wanted to give it to. And then he said, and then when my, my girlfriend came home, I, I cooked the, the meal and it, I cooked it perfectly because I had practiced before. And she said that was the most amazing thing anybody had ever done for her. And she was so happy. So I made her birthday. And that's just off of one question, what's the last gift you gave somebody? But I got like five answers of a guy that I knew was, a, was going to be an amazing fit. And then the third question is, who do you admire for any reason? Because it shows me aspiration. It shows me people who are looking 
to sort of a higher plane and sort of shows me where their their sort of inspiration lies. And I've gotten everything from, you know, my father to Nelson Mandela to Hillary Clinton. But, you know, I'm able to sort of assess why those people and what traits those people have to uh, to make your list of who inspires you. And, you know, if I get amazing answers out of those three, not only are you getting hired, but my guess is you're going to thrive in our company. Love it. Wow, Richard. To change gears just for a moment, and all of that was hands down some of the best information about leadership and hiring and culture. I mean, wow, incredible. But so you have something called hospitality included. And this is a, a new paradigm, a new method of kind of operation, if you will. And I know it's a bit of in, in the infancy stage, but I'm curious, what was the catalyst between either yourself or yourself and Danny? What was the catalyst that had you all step back and say, okay, we're now going to go in this direction? It's a very good question. And I'll tell you, let me just take you back to 1996. And one of the first initiatives that Danny wanted to work on, remember, I joined him as a partner in 96 to create a company. I only had two restaurants, and I remember meeting in his office back then. It was in the basement of Gramercy Tavern, where when uh, it would rain, the pipes would leak, and it would, ba- it would basically drip on our heads in his office. So one of the things he always dreamed about back then was an office that didn't leak on his head, and we, we definitely got that off the list as we grew. But I remember him saying, we are going starting this year, because we only have two businesses, we're going to have what what I want to call hospitality included in 1996. And we're going to eliminate, uh, we're going to eliminate gratuities. And we're going to have one price for everything, just like they do in Europe. And uh, you know, I remember working on it for a good three or four months and, you know, we would meet and, and it was, it was going well. And we got to a point where Danny said, okay, well, let's schedule the all staff meeting to tell people we're going to do this. And let's come out with a press release to say our restaurants are going to be hospitality included. And I would say a week before we were going to do all that, our, accountant or our controller came in and said, I just want you to know that once we start doing this, we're going to lose a lot of money. And we're like, Oh no, we we can't do it if we're going to lose a lot of money. And that sort of became the impediment for us looking at it because we, we flirted with it again in 2002, 2004, maybe. But Danny was always of the mindset that, this should be something that is integrated into our business. But what the catalyst was to answer your question, um, the singular catalyst for this was to eliminate the disparity in wages between front of house and back of house. And that continues to be the primary motivation here because we saw that we were, you know, we were unable to attract top talent in the kitchen by paying wages that, you know, what would, would we would call industry wages. And, and, you know, I think there's sort of this, I don't know, this whatever level of, of pay wage exists for, you know, entry level cooks in any given city, you know, word gets out pretty fast that this, this place pays X number of dollars per hour and this pays whatever people and people shop it. We wanted to not only be competitive with the the best talent that was out there, but we wanted to stop the 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 sort of the existence of we can't find good people on a regular basis because the the wages are too low, the entry level wage for cooks. Why can't we be at the top of of the the ladder for for back of the house talent? The way that we saw doing that was by having the ability to pay people more by not by by having everything rolled into one price on a menu, but it, it was to to make more of a balance between front of the house and back of the house as a career choice. And 
I think part of also, you know, I've heard Danny speak of also with hospitality included, you know, I think it eliminates a certain friction between the the diner and the the front of the house staff in, in terms of, oh, well, now I know that this person isn't just working to get a tip, but they're working to make sure that I have a wonderful experience. Certain companies have tried this. I know like like David Chang with Momofuku, they've, they've tried it on a short term and then pu- pulled it back. Do you think that's because they're more short-sighted and didn't see it through in the long term? Well, I think, you know, I'm not sure this is for everyone. And for us, it's, it's been an investment. We knew it would be invest, an investment. We've also looked at it as a long-term investment because, um, you know, we need to make sure that three things are happening, happening simultaneously. Number one, that the employee experience is as good as it's ever been. And, and part of the employee experience is finance. You know, you want to make the wages, the best wages you can possibly make. The second thing is that the public says, okay, I get it. I'm going to pay one price and there's not going to be a line on my check at the end. Because if you don't know that ahead of time, it does look like sticker shock to see your chicken yesterday being 19, being 26 today. But if you understand that there is no other cost associated with that as the diner, um, then you're okay with it. But, but you know, that's an education uh, process as well. You just don't change the menu price and say, you know, hospitality included and have the diner understand that. That's been sort of, uh, you know, an engagement process. I think we're doing pretty well with that. And the third, it needs to make sense financially for the business and the company. So we're trying to calibrate all three of those things simultaneously. Um, and as we roll this out in different businesses, some take to all three of those pretty quickly. Some are, are more of a work in process. And it's all about, you know, we look at this as it's not a short-term solution. This is the way that we are going to operate our business and our company, you know, forever. And, you know, it's, it's a learning and growing process. Some, some people might look at the math on this short term and go, it doesn't make sense and, and say, we're going to go back to the old system. And I totally understand that, but we've always looked at it as an investment. And so if I know this is a little bit of a loaded question, but to the best of your ability for anyone that's kind of considering jumping in to that type of model, what's just something they should either have in place, be thinking about first or questions to ask themselves before they try and adopt that? I, I think the, the, you know, is this, I, it's like those three pillars again, does it work for your staff? Does it work for your guests? And does it work for your business model? And if you can get to yes on those, or if you can get to, I think over a certain period of time, we can get there. That, that might be the, the sort of filter I would use, but those are the three pillars that we apply to all of our businesses for HI. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Richard, as we're starting to get a little bit longer here in the, in the episode, I do want to, as we're thinking about time, ask you a question kind of about you and how you spend your time. Are there any ways that you that you um, direct your day? Is it things you do in the morning or uh, throughout the day that help you to really optimize and be efficient with your time? Well, that's a you know, it's another good question, and I think you can ask thousands of people what the most effective use of time is. Um, and I, you know, for me, it's, it's where can I have the most impact? Because at, at the level I'm at, or when you're a C level person, you, you need to be a catalyst, a catalyst, no matter where you go for impact. You know, there's, there's the, when you get to this level, I don't know that there are any neutral transactions you should have. So, if you're engaging in one with one person at one time, how can you make that the most meaningful engagement that you do? And, you know, that, that's the way you sort of got to look at it. And I think the, the key thing is now for me, it's all about, uh, you know, alignment, mentoring, calibration, adding value, no matter where I go. And it's really, you know, developing leaders 
the, the you know next generation leaders of of either teaching them you know how to look at things how to analyze things connecting with them uh it's it, it, it again it's all about connections with people and making each transaction or each engagement meaningful and uh you know, I think people that are really good at this have a, a really good sort of heat map of where they need to be. Um, but my day, I, you know, I purposely, my calendar, if you were to look at it, it would not only not look, it, it would not e- only not look like Swiss cheese with a lot of holes in it. You would, you'd look at my calendar and you would say, gosh, you don't do anything all day. There's not much on here. But the truth is, uh, I start my day with Danny for about a half hour with what we call a clipboard session where I've got a clipboard and we sort of bounce ideas back and forth. And once my clipboard gets filled up after about a half hour, um, I've got a week's worth of stuff on that. And um, I can then take my calendar and strategically put some things in it. But I also leave enough time in my calendar to just go somewhere, and if there's a meeting happening, I can drop in and add value and not go, I can't go to that meeting because I'm booked. The one thing I hate when I hear in our company is when executives tell me I'm booked back to back to back to back to back. That does not give you the opportunity to just be, to just say, you know, if Danny, if Danny were to wait outside of, of our call today, you know, I don't have anything booked after this and purposefully I would want the ability just to go hang out with Danny for 15 minutes. Cause we're going to make things better or drop in on the chief culture officer and go what's going on today. And again, I think people get too fixated on putting stuff on their calendar to matter as opposed to saying, I'm going to go and make things better no matter where I go or I'm going to add value. And that's sort of the way I look at it. Yeah. No, I love that. Richard, thank you so much for your time. You've given us a wealth of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, is there anything kind of final to leave the audience with that, that you want them to take away from, from you and your career slash your restaurant um, industry as a whole? Yeah. You know, I would say that if, you know, if I looked back on the, the most virtuous, uh, element that's helped me, and I can tell you the same thing for Danny, is that patience is not only a virtue, but it's also a very good business strategy and often leads to better results. A lot of people need to say, I need to make a decision now. I need to do this. I need to get this off my plate. Patience is really what I think has made USHG uh, what it is thus far, um, and will continue to exercise patience, not to an extreme. But patience equals to thoughtful outcomes because you're able to process things. Yeah, that's, that's great. Sean, anything else from you? Richard, it has been incredible, incredible value that you have shared with us. And we're super appreciative that you took the time. Honored to, honored to know you think so highly of us to put me on. So that was our conversation with Richard Corain. Sean, what, what do you got for us? Yeah, I mean, so many, so many great takeaways, number one. Uh, a couple of things that really stood out to me was when he was talking about how when they were excelling, it was because they grew from within. And when they were failing, it was because they hired individuals from the outside, high level individuals with good credentials, good pedigree, but just from outside of the company. And I thought that was a very interesting thing that he talked about. And I can see how that would be true for a lot of people, a lot of companies. Another thing was when he was talking about what the employees essentially wanted from him and he established these three things that employees want from a good leader. And that was one, a compass, right? What direction are they going in? Two, wisdom. Um, and I like how he said uh, they would like to, they, uh, in so many words, check out a book from time to time for me, like he was a library. That was really cool. And then number three was a cheerleader, somebody that's going to give them that positive reinforcement. And a subset to that being a cheerleader is that he said high performers and high achievers, they always want to do a good job um, and that they will mess up from time to time. And they just sometimes want to know that it's it's not going to be fatal, if you will, in so many words, that it, that they're going to be able to continue on and to give them that positive reinforcement and motivation. I think when somebody makes the same mistake two and three and four times, obviously they're not learning from their mistakes and that's a different story, but just like a one-time thing. So I, I really enjoyed his take on what those employees are looking for in a good leader. How about you? 
Yeah, you know, I think you know, you know, he says, you know, giving them the latitude to, so you know, this is what I want you to do. This is how you know I want you to do it, and then at that point, giving them the latitude to make their own decisions based on that. So yeah, I think that was really insightful. Um, you know, along the same lines, you know, there he was talking there towards the end about you know three questions he asks in the interview process. He says, you know, how do you how do people perceive you that you think they get wrong about you? You know that obviously helps people helps you to understand the kind of self awareness somebody has you know uh, about themselves. And the number two question you know, was was the last gift you gave someone for any reason? I think it says a lot about your heart and kind of where you're coming from and your willingness and, and desire to to want to you know make people happy. And then number three uh, being you know, who do you admire? Yeah, you know, at the end at the end of the day, I think that shows really kind of you know what's guiding us and who we really want to be uh, when it's all said and done. And then it kind of at the very end, he spoke of of patience and how that's been one of the, the leading causes of their success. You know, whether it's been with with their their expansion, but also with you know, talking about you know hospitality included, really being mindful of the fact that, hey, this is a long-term play. We're in this for the long haul, and it's not going to be perfect overnight, but if we stick with the course, uh, things will, will pay off for us in the long run. So a lot of great insights, a lot of uh, really valuable uh, little nuggets of knowledge from, from Richard throughout the conversation. Y'all let us know what you think. We'd love to hear uh, in the comments on, on the website or on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your, your podcasts. But thank you for joining us here in 2018. We wish you a very happy new year. And with that, we'll leave you with a final quote from Richard. It's all about connections with people and making each transaction or engagement meaningful. And with that, we're signing off. We'll be right back.